Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. Sometimes things break. We are imperfect creatures making imperfect machines on an imperfect planet, floating around in an imperfect cosmos. The best we can hope for is to apply order and process to dealing with things when they break, so that we can triage the problems, figure out which is the highest priority based upon the facts of the situation, and then hopefully clean up the mess. That's where a trouble ticket system comes in handy. After all, if you're handling problems at multiple locations and issues with multiple platforms and you happen to have multiple people handling those issues, then tracking these problems isn't a bad idea. After all, maybe Phil is really good with printers and he should be looking after the printer problems first. And Denise, she's a wizard with hardware, so when the magic smoke escapes from the computer, you really want Denise on that case. Jim, he's a, uh, he's a server guy. People need to get things on a server, set up file sharing, or connect services. Well, then Jim is your guy. The ticketing system helps get the problems in front of the people most capable of fixing them. And if you work in IT or library IT or any IT, I really don't need to tell you more about that. A ticketing system is kind of a standard thing. Meanwhile, an oft-forgotten feature is the ability to mark the problem as fixed. I don't think there's a tech who's worked in the field for more than a year that winds up with a problem that they're ready to solve, only to find out it was fixed a couple days ago, and someone just didn't close the ticket. So when something gets fixed, you need to mark it as such, and that way people can move on. The biggest problem? Well, there's more than one. Trouble ticket systems can be extremely expensive, and only available on a subscription-style basis. Seems to be where things are heading these days is that whole subscription model. They can be a pain in the neck to set up. Sometimes it seems like you need a person in charge of the ticketing system, and that's all they do. And in some cases, that's actually the case. There are organizations and libraries out there where someone does nothing more than manage the ticketing system. So geez, wouldn't it be nice if there was a simple, easy-to-use ticketing system that didn't cost a shed load of money? Well, this ain't Disneyland, chummers, but I got your e-ticket regardless. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 45, Tickets, Please. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology and is all about living the high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hey there, hi there, ho there, and welcome back to Cyberpunk Librarian, coming at you from the deserts of the Southwest where men are real men, women are real women, and the asphalt is really melting. It's lovely to be all with you again, talking into the mic and actually getting a show out on the feeds. I tell you folks, summer reading is approaching, and with that, both projects, you know, personal, professional, and all that, it's been crazy around the local parts of the Phoenix sprawl. So, hey, I thank you for hanging on, I thank you for tuning in, and I think we have a geeky little show for you today. So I wanted to do some uh, quick follow-up from the last show, which makes all kinds of sense because it would be hard to you know, follow up on anything from the next show. So yeah, I don't often do follow-up, but I've had more of it here recently. But if you recall, on the last show, we talked about pirate boxes and how freakishly cool they are. I'm still playing with mine. I love it. Anyway... 
as it happens, the Pirate Box's lead developer, Matthias Struble, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering that name, Matthias, contacted me through the site with a couple of corrections that I wanted to share with you. He writes, the original Pirate Box image on piratebox.cc is based upon Arch Linux. At the beginning, you introduced the Pirate Box image as being Raspbian based. Library Box is the sister slash brother to Pirate Box, and Library Box contributed enhancements to Pirate Box and the other way around. We're currently working on bringing both of these projects closer together. So a little bit of correction there. If I get something wrong, I like to, you know, make sure that I get the right information out. So thank you so much, Matthias, for letting me know so I can let the listeners know when I get something wrong. You can read his full comment in the notes for episode 44 at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Okay, so yes, let's move on now. And we're going to talk about something kind of geeky, even for this show. Because we're going to talk about a trouble ticket system that I happened across. Now, without boring you with all the details, I'm working on a couple of projects at work where we might want, maybe need, or at least perhaps we desire, a separate trouble ticket system from the one we use for our mainline IT and facilities problems. Now, I'm waffling on that because we've not yet decided if we're going to go this route yet. But I've had some time to play with it, and I figure that even if it won't work for me, Someone out there in electric library land might find it useful. So when the possibility of a ticketing system arose, I started casting my line around the web to see if there was anything available that fit our budget, which was somewhere between zero and the cost of a cup of coffee, and I would have to spring for the cup of coffee. Needless to say, I was on the hunt for a free, open source solution that we could run ourselves. That way, you know, no hosting costs, no high overhead, and hopefully a low price. I tried several things from standalone projects that kind of sort of didn't work in a few cases. There were some WordPress plugins which really didn't deliver on what I was after. And I was shocked that I was coming up empty, actually. I mean, good lord. There are some powerful content management systems out there running on amazing web servers with huge databases and What's really awesome is they're all free and open source. It seemed like, you know, when you look at complex projects like WordPress or Drupal or Apache or MySQL, Coppermine, and so on, you would think a trouble ticketing system must surely be available alongside of them. But I, w I really wasn't coming up with anything satisfactory. I was coming up with sort of, if you'll pardon the expression, half-assed projects that weren't really what they claim to be. And I was about ready to give up when I stumbled over a, sol over a solution. It was, you know, it wasn't quite exactly what I was after, but it was pretty darn close. Now, it was easy to set up, so we see that if you set up a WordPress site from scratch, you could do it. It's easy to manage and configure. It runs on the standard open source LAMP stack, and it's free and open source itself. I wasn't completely joking around in the intro, so let's get cozy for a few minutes and let's talk about eTicket, a browser-based trouble ticketing system for everyone. So, quick note before we get started, from what I've seen, eTicket breaks on a server running PHP 7, which is the latest version of PHP. So you might want to keep a classic PHP 5 server around for stuff like this, or run both versions if you know how to make that happen. Either way, you'll need the standard LAMP stack to get things all up and running. And I think you're going to find that to be a, uh, a real thing here recently, with PHP 7 just kind of really getting out there in the wild with the latest Ubuntu server distro, yeah, you know, you're going to see some stuff that isn't configured well to run on PHP 7, so you might want to keep a classic PHP 5 server around just in case something does not work on the new version of PHP. 
Okay, so the installation process is pretty standard for a PHP web app. You're going to need to create a database, a user for that database, and a password for that user. If you're at all familiar with using PHP MyAdmin to administer a MySQL database, then this is old hat for you. I mean, you could type it in impure SQL in a command line, but why? Once you're set up on that end, you unzip the files and, you know, download it from eTicket's website and drop them onto your web server's hosting directory. By the way, I'll have links to uh, eTicket's website in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Anyway, you'll want to check the really simple instructions for installation that they have on the website as they give you the permissions you'll need to assign to a few key files before and after the installation. Once you've chmodded and perhaps chowned, launch install.php in your browser and you're on the road. It's very similar, like I said, to setting up a WordPress installation or something like that. It's going to ask you some standard stuff, like the name of your database user and password that we just set up not that long ago. It'll ask you for some configuration questions like the name you would like your admin account to be, the password for that account and what you'd like your default support department to be. In this case, you can kind of think of departments like support categories. It starts you off with a default of support, makes sense, but you can change this later if you like. Nod and smile, answer the questions, and if you set up your database properly, you'll be set up in minutes. As an admin on eTicket, you'll have access to a bunch of options to make your trouble ticketing system your own and make it work for you and your customers. You can set up the system to receive attachments, which is excellent as a screenshot is worth a thousand words and a car trip to a remote location. Anyone who's worked support and a help desk can tell you, it's a happy day when someone sends a screenshot of the problem. So I highly recommend you roll with the attachments idea. Security concerns are, well, concerning, so you can set limits on what kinds of files can be sent as attachments. That way you can limit people from sending you .exe files, for instance. Given your environment, you're probably going to want to enable things like JPEGs, uh, bitmaps for Windows screenshots, pings for macOS screenshots, PDFs for documents, and, you know, anything that you need, might need. The good thing is, is anything you don't allow is disallowed. So that'll keep things pretty tight. You want to set up some kind of email access because eTicket can send updates to your techs and your customers as tickets are worked on, changed, updated, and so on. So when you're working a front desk and things are broken, that automated email saying that a tech is working on the problem, that's comforting to say the least. Techs can use the e-ticket system to send messages and pass tickets off to each other. After all, when multiple things are going wrong, and they often do, you might need multiple specialists working on the problem. On this front, you have three options. You can relay mail through an SMTP server, send it with send mail, or use PHP mail. Obviously, choose the one that works best for you. For serious, get your email set up. It'll save you a lot of work, and the emails sent within and through eTicket are tracked, and they're kept with the trouble ticket. So everything is kept in a nice, tight bundle with the ticket. So that's lovely. Speaking of mail, you can set up a bunch of custom responses and notices for your system. Among others, eTicket gives you the ability to set up new ticket replies. So when a new ticket is sent, you know, this message goes out. And this is the message to tell the customer that the ticket is in the system and someone will get to it as soon as possible. Then there's a new message reply that informs the customer that the ticket is actually being worked on. And, you know, there are new messages. If there are new messages, then it will let, it, you know, let that customer know. So not only does the customer get an email when the ticket is claimed and people start working on it, the tech or whoever can also send messages through eTicket to update the customer on progress if there's you know any updates to be sent out as progress is made. Obviously, some tickets are pretty easy, they're a quick fix, and you just fix it. Then there's ticket limit messages for 
the person who always seems to have 10 things wrong at a time. So you can kind of just sort of cut them off at a given threshold and say, you know, if you're having 10 things wrong or more at the same time, someone needs to come talk to you. And then they probably need to take your computer away. Then there are transfer messages for when a ticket is transferred to another tech or assigned to a different category. After all, that PC support ticket, that might actually be a printer issue in disguise. Once you figure that out, you can assign it to the proper category. Speaking of categories, these refer to the types of support. For my friends out there who aren't sure what that means, we're talking about separating tickets along lines of expertise. So a hardware support question is different from a software support ticket, which is different from the printer issues, and that's separate from the network issues, which really aren't related to the point of sale problems, and you'll want to keep those away from the website support, and yes, you'll likely want a category specifically for e-ticket itself. After all, maybe you need a new user added to the system, or something comes up, you know, with the system. Yes, as a matter of fact, you can send trouble tickets about the trouble ticketing system. It happens more often than you might might realize. No worries, though, because if you need to add categories, it's really easy to do so. You can even assign a specific category to a tech, if you like. That way, all, you know, that way, for instance, all the software support issues go to Jennifer because she's the software expert. And all those networking problems go to Bill because Bill is great with the Cisco goodies. Speaking of Jennifer and Bill, you're going to need to give them accounts since they're going to use eTicket as help desk representatives. That, that's a quick process of giving eTicket a name and an email address along with a password. You can assign them to preset roles to give them different levels of permissions within the system, too. After all, I don't think everyone needs to be an admin as on, on the eTicket system. But once they're granted the access and the permissions, they can handle tickets. Really, like many systems, eTicket is set up to where you can RTFM or poke the box or both. I think the best way to figure out what will work best for you is to just set up an instance of it and start playing and experimenting. If all else fails, you can blow it away and reinstall it again in a few minutes. All right, so all of that is nice and everything, but administration and initial setup should be something you do once and then just sort of run maintenance and changes on as needed, right? So if we're going to have a help desk ticketing system, we should probably talk about what the workflow is like, hmm? E-Ticket makes it really easy to handle and submit tickets. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be sitting here telling you about it. If this were a pain in the butt, I'd probably just not do a show on it. So customers who will send you tickets will obviously need access to the website that E-Ticket runs on. Now, you can run E-Ticket out on the open web, or you can run it within an extranet or behind a firewall on an intranet. And, you know, I think for most libraries, you'll probably want this thing sitting on an intranet, but you know, obviously you pick the method that works best for you and your organization. When the staff or the customer hits the site, they're going to find two things. One, they're going to be able to send in a new support ticket. No surprises there, of course. And two, they can check on the status of an existing ticket. Now, sending in a new ticket is... it's pretty rote. There's not much to be had there. They'll be asked for their name, an email, uh, a support department, so they kind of pick what the problem is from a preset list. They'll be asked for a subject, a message, and then they can set the priority of the request. So with the subject, they might say, printer issue at Choya branch. Okay. And the message would be describing the printer issue that they're having. And then they can set the priority of the request, as I said. So if, you know, there's only one printer at this branch and everybody's printing to it, but right now nobody's printing to it because the printer is broken, they might want to set that as a high priority. So, you know, things like that. When they click submit, the ticket is assigned a number, which they'll see on screen, and they'll quickly have an email in their inbox letting them know the request was successful. Now, all this email is is just saying, yes, we received your ticket and it went through. 
And you can also uh, add whatever information you want included in that custom email response that we talked about earlier. Now then, if the customer needs to check on an existing ticket, all they need to do is go to that same website and then enter in their email address and that ticket number. And, you know, that pops into the appropriate boxes on the website and it'll pull up what's going on right now with that ticket and what's been done. It's a great way of sort of keeping everybody in the loop without endless emails going back and forth and back and forth. Depending on how you set up your e-ticket system, your techs might have to monitor for new tickets or... If you've set it up to have e-tickets in an email based on specific categories, then the tech will get the email when the ticket comes in. I know a lot of places that basically do both. You'll have, uh, you know, the techs will typically have the ticket queue up on a screen and emails running in the background so they can kind of see what's going on. After all, you know, while most techs have specialties, it doesn't mean they don't know how to fix something else when they're on site. As tickets are worked and passed off and hopefully closed, emails will go out automatically to inform concerned parties as to what's going on. That way, like I said, we avoid this endless email chain of, did you update someone? Well, I thought you updated someone. No, no, no. E-ticket will update someone. That's why you want to use the e-ticket system, because as you do things, people get updated. That's sort of the point. When a ticket is finally closed, the person who sent the ticket can get an email that the problem is resolved, or if it's not resolved, then why that's the case. Of course, all of this is kept within eTickets database, so if you need to search for previous tickets, you can make that happen. And for those who haven't dealt with a trouble ticketing system on their own, it's quite normal to pop in the resolution to this ticket as, you know, basically, what did you do to fix the problem? And that way, if that problem comes up again, and it likely will, Techs can go searching for that information. After all, it acts as a knowledge base, too. So the final thing here to ask is, can e-ticket replace a commercial-grade help desk system? Well, the wishy-washy answer is yes and no, and that everything depends on what you need out of your trouble ticket solution. I can say that at the low, low price of free, it's worth a couple of hours of your time to set it up and investigate how it works and whether or not it works for you. I don't know how well it would work for a large library organization or just a large organization with branches all over a large metro area or a county-wide area. That kind of geography and complexity may require, you know, an equal amount of complexity and nuance in a help desk system that e-ticket just doesn't offer. But for a local system of a few branches, I think it'd be a nifty solution, especially in a budget-crunched world, which we all seem to be in right now. After all, we're all about that high-tech and low-budget lifestyle last time I checked. And on that front, e-ticket delivers. Check it out. And that about wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Library, and I hope e-ticket is something you might be able to use or you know someone that might be able to use that for themselves. I know, an, you know a trouble ticketing solution, that's a weird thing to be talking about, but it's one of those sort of toolbox things that you kind of want to have around if you're in any sort of IT environment or any sort of environment at all where you are servicing some customers and you've got multiple people that need to communicate multiple problems to you. And when it comes right down to it, a FOSS solution like eTicket is pretty cool, and I think it's worth your time. So check out the links in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. You'll find links there to download it and all of that good stuff. The song you're currently digging on is Spectrum Subdiffusion Mix by Phonics. Earlier in the show, you heard Hedonic State by Mike B. Ford and OST 11, Where Am I? As always, the opening track to the show is Belly Dance at a Bisu by Ryo Miyashita. And I'll have links in the show notes where you can pick up those songs if you would be so interested in that. 
Besides cyberpunklibrarian.com, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian, where I occasionally get a post up when I have the time about things about the show, things cyberpunk, and things you might be interested in if you happen to be a like-minded cyberpunk librarian. And for those of you who like to listen to your audio on a video site, we're also available on youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. So if you don't want to subscribe to the RSS feed or check us out on iTunes, you can always subscribe to us on YouTube. And if you need to get in touch with me, I love it when people do that. You can hit me up on Twitter. I am at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. I'm also hitting up Google Plus these days at google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. Or if you just want to hit me through the standard SMTP method of transferring information, I'm cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. So, hey, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully get a show up sooner than a month after that. I know I say that a lot. It's been so crazy. I kind of forgot that summer reading was coming. I think it wasn't so much a forgetting thing as is just, you know, how the brain removes traumatic memories of past times. So now that uh, summer reading is going to be going into full swing here soon, that actually means that things calm down because it's a lot of buildup to push that ball down the hill and that ball is going to roll down the hill pretty soon. If you're a librarian out there in electric library land, I wish you the best summer reading program that you can have. And hey, if nothing else, you can check us out back here on Cyberpunk Librarian for the next episode, hopefully up in two weeks. I know I promised that and hopefully I can actually deliver on it this time. So with luck, I will see you two weeks from now, or at least you will be listening to me two weeks from now because it's hard to look at you through the microphone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. And hey, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there.